morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where today's episode has a theme. I couldn't get a straight flush. It doesn't extend all the way through the viewer question, but all three stories have to do with Hollywood having to fix, or probably having to fix in the near future, if they even can fix it, obvious, stupid, sloppy mistakes. Now, I'm sure some of you are already typing down below, but Grace, surely Ridley Scott did not know that Kevin Spacey was engaged in sexual assault. Maybe he knew some stuff wasn't so great, uh, but hey, everyone's adults. Well, that actually was not the case, uh, but hey, he's an artist and all that, right? Well, as we're seeing in story after story after story after story, a lot of people did know, or at least suspected, that this type of behavior across the board was going on. I think that Scott Rosenberg, a screenwriter, he wrote Beautiful Girls and was uh, working with Harvey Weinstein at the height of Weinstein's power, put it best in an editorial for Deadline when he said, we all knew, but we were making so much money, nobody wanted to derail the money train. And that's the thing, that's what drives Hollywood. Money, we've talked about this many times before. The sudden diversification trend in Hollywood, it's, a, it's coming from the fact that they can now make money off of it, right? And for a very long time, Hollywood was motivated to look the other way by money, right? They were dealing with you know name talent, these people had fan bases, and so they wanted to protect that person's ability to not only be in their project, but to make money for them. Why destroy something that had already been built, right? Uh, and that's something that's been going on, by the way, in Hollywood since the very beginning. There are horrible studio system stories uh, with the things that were swept under the rug. For instance, Clark Gable ran into a woman and killed the lady in a car crash, uh, and someone else, uh, you know, the studio got someone else to take the fall for it and monetarily uh, compensated their family uh, for the rest of their life, and that person had to go to jail. So this is not something new in Hollywood. But what's finally happening is that it's now more expensive. Uh, it's, 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 you know, instead of making money by looking the other way, it costs them a tremendous amount of money. So now they can't afford to look the other way. That's what's going to have to motivate them. I also believe, and so it's sad that that's what it has to, that's what it has to be. I mean, we're talking in many cases here about a legal criminal appalling horror, like the Charlie Sheen allegations yesterday. I mean, again, these are alleged, uh, but you know, for that information, I don't see how that information could come out, for instance, um, about child pornography and when he was divorcing Denise Richards and he wasn't arrested. It's, it's illegal to have that material. But anyway, I think, you know, some people don't know. Some people know, and so they're no, no longer going to be able to look the other way because it just costs so much damn money. But then some people are going to be like, well, look, I didn't know. And I'm sure some people didn't know. And they're like, but, you know, I can't have this happen to me again. So don't be surprised if going forward there are scandal clauses in contracts for all talent, all named talent in particular, in front of and behind the camera, where the studio or the producer says, if, if talent, if said talent knowingly engages in behavior that could hurt the image of the production, they are monetarily liable for, you know, whatever reshoots are necessary. I also, we could, we should be able to recoup their salary, etc. I just think that, you know, there's too many people, too many people's careers and livelihoods on the line here uh, to, to not be, resp I mean, they have insurance in case something happens to someone physically. I think that they're now going to have to have a scan. And, you know, you, no one would insure this, by the way, either, because you can't guarantee someone's going to not do something bad because you know, they're hiding it. They're, I mean, that's the whole name of the game. It's secret behavior. So you can't get insurance for it, but then you're, so you're just going to have to hold the talent liable. And that's the direction that I think Hollywood should move in. Uh, so anyway, what's going on with Kevin Spacey? Well, he's been being removed now from not just one, but two projects. Now, we all heard just a few days ago that House of Cards was rewriting him out of the final, well, season six, which is supposedly the final season. But I think that having Robin Wright be the, so the sole star of the show could breathe a new life into it. And I'm very happy for her. You know, I had given her the, uh, I'd given Kevin Spacey the benefit of the, benefit of the doubt and, um, their negotiations, Robin Wright feeling she's not been treated fairly on a show where she is, as far as the fans are concerned, a co-star. Um, but now we can see that Kevin Spacey, understatement of the year, is not a nice person. Uh, and so Robin Wright probably has not been done particularly well on that show. And so I feel it would be wonderful. If, it would be a great thing to come out of this that she would take over the show. And again, as I said, perhaps give it a whole, a whole new lease on life. But also, this is a story that broke late last night that captivated so many of you, and that's that Ridley Scott is going to replace Kevin Spacey in his All the Money in the World movie, the Getty kidnapping movie, with Christopher Plummer. And he's still going to make his release date. That's what makes the story so incredible. There are a couple of things that make the story so incredible. That in today's day and age, you could replace an actor so quickly. Uh, the, the Kevin Spacey story has become so crazy. And then also that anybody would spend this much money and make this much effort for all the money in the world. I'm sorry, Ridley Scott, but I just don't think this movie is going to connect 
under any circumstances. Maybe there will be a curiosity factor now with this patch job that you're doing. Uh, but I think that the 1% isn't particularly sympathetic uh, these days. I mean, there was a time when everybody was captivated by it, but today, that, today is not that day. Uh, and so I think that there are also a number of other awards contenders that are much stronger and are breaking down ba bar barriers and, and breaking new ground. And I think that people are going to want to reward those films instead. And that's like Ridley Scott's not at the top of his game either, right? This isn't like the Paul Thomas Anderson movie has a problem and they're like, you're like, oh yes, please go back and reshoot it. Call up Daniel Day-Lewis. I need to see this thing. It's like, nah, I think we just have potential. I mean, the trailer looked very good to me, but I've, you know, it could also be another The Counselor. So... I don't know why they want to throw more money after uh, bad at this point. Uh, so why does uh, Ridley Scott feel that he can make still make his December 22nd release date? Which, by the way, he's still working very hard to meet because he honestly believes this is an awards contender. Uh, I mean, Christopher Plummer already has an Oscar, and uh, I don't think they're going to want to reward this film in, 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 in any degree. So, uh, so, he's, so Kevin Spacey only shot for like two weeks to make this movie, uh, you know, to do his, his, his small role in All the Money in the World, playing John Paul Getty, you know, huge amount of latex, as we saw from the trailer, you know, uh, basically. You know, I guess this opens up, up for Gary Oldman, uh, you know, in his Winston Churchill role. He no longer has any, you know, another latex performance to compete against. Uh, just Andy Serkis then, I suppose, right? Uh, digital makeup. Uh, and uh, so he, so Kevin Spacey only shot for two weeks, and they're going to put Christopher Plummer in there. And get this, they might digitally replace him in some scenes, or they might just replace Kevin Spacey's head with Christopher Plummer. That's amazing. And then Mark Wahlberg and Michelle Williams are going to come back and reshoot a few scenes. But for the most part, all of Kevin Spacey's scenes were just him, and, you know, in, like, um, you know, non-name talent. So even if the original talent is available, they'll just replace them. That sucks for that talent, boy. But, you know, that's, that's Hollywood, uh, especially these days. So, but again, Mark Wahlberg and Michelle Williams, you know, I don't really think this is a, a, is a particularly strong contender, right? Again, why spend all this money on this? Uh, I would just throw it out there at the last minute and hope some people went to see it. But I would just pick, take it as a write-off at this point. And also, it's worth noting that Christopher Plummer is who Ridley Scott wanted for the role in the first place, but the studio had said, we need a name. And so they came up with Kevin Spacey. I mean, before this scandal, I think Kevin Spacey and Christopher Plummer were on par. Kevin Spacey hasn't been a movie name for quite some time. And also, they need to understand what a name is, both Ridley Scott and apparently the studios, because this reminds me of when uh, Ridley Scott came under fire for whitewashing X. Exodus, and he said, but I need name talent for the movie. And everyone was able to nail him to the wall saying, oh yeah, because Joel Edgerton is a huge star. So we'll see what happens. But I think that Hollywood, you know, again, they'll finally be motivated by not wanting to lose money, whereas before they were making money by looking the other way. And I wouldn't, and I, that's scandal clause. It's a damn good idea. I hope Hollywood, Hollywood does that. All right, so that's the first story of the day. Now, the other disaster that needs to be fixed right now is Universal's Dark Universe. And it was reported yesterday that it's a sad, it's in a sad state indeed. With, I loved this visual. An empty building at Universal, which has been done in monster decorations, uh, but is now abandoned. I mean, talk about putting the cart before the horse. I'd be like, did you spend, just admit it, did you spend more time decorating this, uh, these headquarter offices uh, than on the actual movies themselves? And they're like, maybe we did. Darn it. And also, I'd be like, why don't you decorate the office with all this monster, uh, you know, stuff? And the first photo you released for Dark Universe had absolutely no monster stuff in it. It was just, you know, like a, a business type photo with everybody just wearing business, you know, uh, you know uh, office casual. I thought that was ridiculous. All right, so anyway, Alex Kurtzman and Chris Morgan have left Dark Universe. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> it's so ridiculous they were hired in the first place. Alex Kurtzman has gone back to Star Trek. He's, uh, you know, an executive producer on Star Trek Discovery. He's going he's gonna to double down on that. The only thing in his career that's ever worked for him, and I think it's awfully spotty, to be honest with you. And then Chris Morgan's going back to the Fast and Furious. He does a good job there. I think that's a good place for him. It's weird. He can only do one thing. I think it's pretty obvious that they said, who should take over Dark Universe? Who should do our monster movies? The guy behind. Star Trek and the guys behind Star Trek and Fast and Furious and you'd be like that makes no sense those brands don't match what are you nuts I mean that's one of the sad things about the uh, the story is that Bride of Frankenstein which had Bill Condon attached who was the perfect talent in terms of matching talent to material has been put in limbo uh, you know it's lost its really it's, it's Valentine's Day release date which was so fabulous it's and it's just you know Condon's still attached but who knows when the heck that thing's gonna come together and that's very sad because he was he was just a perfect match with the material uh, now they're saying they're gonna they're not giving up on making monster movies but they might not be connected they might not be trying to do a cinematic universe and interestingly DC has recently said the same thing I guess making these connected stories is difficult you know Marvel's able to do it uh, 
I think it's actually not that difficult. I mean, television shows do it all the time. Make an effort, Hollywood. Damn it. All right. So anyway, a lot of dams in today's episode. It's frustrating. So they are saying Universal's considering giving it to Jason Blum, which I think is one of the most brilliant ideas I've ever heard. He comes from a horror background. Uh, he's been tremendously, you know, a, a tremendous um, asset to Universal. He's this year alone given them split and get out. And then also he's the one who uh, talked up James Wan to take over Furious 7, which, uh, you know, James Wan not only did a fabulous job creatively, but really handled that curveball of the tragic death of Paul Walker quite well. Uh, and so Jason Blum is known for quality filmmaking and has a great eye for talent. So I, th I, mean, I know he's usually used to making cheaper films, but I think he could totally step up to the plate and run, you know, the universe, or, or at least pick talent to do so and, you know, attach talent and then let them go. I think it would be fabulous. And again, you know, it just seems like the next natural progress progression for Jason Blum as a brand and as, a, as someone whose home is universal. So I think, I hope that's actually what happens. I, I'll be curious to, know if, to see if Jason Blum wants it. He's been wanting to, wanting to break out of horror, uh, but perhaps it's inescapable. Perhaps his fate is inescapable. And these are such, this is such an exciting, iconic thing, series to work on. For someone who is involved in the horror industry, I don't know how he could you know, pass it up if the offer is made. So I think it's a great idea. And it's, as I tweeted yesterday, it's as brilliant an idea as giving it to Alex Kurtzman was stupid. I mean, I could have told you how Alex, you know, Alex Kurtzman's The Mummy would have turned out. And it turned out exactly as one, as one would expect. Now, here's the, for the third story of the day, here's a film that I also don't think is going to turn out. But this is the one that I said that might be a problem in the near future. Because it's just coming together. But again, you can see the problem taking shape. And it's amazing to me that no one's like, stop, we're making a horrible mistake. So what am I talking about? Well, Black Adam's in the news again, this time officially. Because, you know, yesterday the Suicide Squad 2 story was a rumor. But Dwayne Johnson, the master of self-promotion. You know, I actually, as much as I enjoyed Central Intelligence, I think that him meeting Kevin Hart was one of the worst things that ever happened to him. I think Kevin Hart is a horrible influence on Dwayne Johnson, who I strongly believe is a family brand. But he's intent on not being a family brand. But anyway, he said, oh, guys, get excited. I put my Rampage writer, <laughs> his Rampage writer on Black Adam. And he said, this is going to be amazing. And then he, in his social media post, he said, and I quote, and we're going to bring this complex and gritty anti-hero to the big screen. The character's in my bones. Ruthless code. And you're like, okay, that sounds pretty good. But then you're like, all right, let's look at this guy you've picked to write it, uh, Dwayne Johnson. Adam uh, Stickiel. I mean, talk about a name. I'm like, Adam Stickiel, do you never want anyone to say your name? I mean, I know you're a screenwriter, but someday you could be a director. All right, so anyway, and we're talking about writers too these days. So not only has he written Rampage, which is how he met The Rock, but he's written Due Date, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, The Long Haul, Maid of Honor, and Alvin and the Chipmunks, The Road Chip. Does that sound like someone who could not only write Black Adam, but deliver what Dwayne Johnson was just talking about? I mean, The Rock's co-producing this along with the DCEU. I don't know how they allowed that to happen. And this sounds like every other Rock movie. I mean, is he playing Black Adam or is he just playing The Rock wearing Black Adam's outfit, right? I mean, I thought the DCEU was fixing this. I thought they turned a corner. And by the way, some of you have been saying, stop saying DCEU. They said that's not the term. Well, they didn't give me an alternative. So until they give me an alternative term, to reference it, re reference it by, I'm still going with DCEU. I don't know why someone would say that's not what we call it, but then not say this is what we call it. It's ridiculous. It's as ridiculous as this story. So I just, I mean, you can see how a movie's going to take shape by the talent attached. Talent rarely changes its stripes. I mean, what they've done in the past is a good example of what they can do in the future. Maybe they can get better at it. Maybe they can up their game. But, you know, that's what they're capable of doing, and you know, generally. And so I don't see how someone who writes comedy films is going to be able to deliver a Black Adam that will appease fans. I mean, really, it's seeming more and more like you're just going to get a Dwayne... Uh, a Dwayne Johnson movie in Black Adam clothing. And the fact that the DCEU would allow this to happen just shows me that they maybe haven't learned anything whatsoever. So frustrating. All right, so let's get to the viewer question, which is from Thorne, who says, Hi, Grace, I have a question. I watched all season two of Stranger Things, and I really loved it. Ah, glad to hear that. But I noticed that they have different directors and writers each episode. How does that work? How are they getting a cohesive story? Nice word, Thorne. Uh, thanks for passing on the movie knowledge. Great question. So basically what Thorne wants to know, particularly I think with something like Stranger Things, if it plays like a nine hour movie, how come it's not made like a nine hour movie? They don't divide movies up into chunks and hand them out to different writers and directors. Why do they do that with television? Well, this is the way television has always been done. And that's, I think, in large part because of the shooting schedule. You have something that has to come out 
weekly. So you can't have a single person working on each episode. You just, from a time perspective, you just couldn't do it. And even when something's binge watched, you know, dropped all at once like Stranger Things, you know, they, they have only so much time to turn it around, right? From the, from the, the starting out what you want to do in season two, you know, from conception all the way due to, to all the way through to wrapping all nine episodes. I mean, it would take way too long to get each season of a show if just one person were to make it. So that's why they divide it up. And that's why it's so important to have uh, writers in, at the head when it comes to television. That's why writers are king on the small screen, because uh, king or queen, because they need to they need to make sure that, 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 that it does come across as cohesive, that it has the right tone. And that's why there's something called a writer's room. Uh, now, the writer's room is run by the showrunners, who are, again, the writers. Uh, you know, the Duffer brothers run Stranger Things. Uh, D.B. Weiss and David Benioff run Game of Thrones. Uh, Matthew Weiner, Mad Men, etc., etc. You know, you'll notice, again, it's always the writers. Sometimes the writers will become directors and direct a couple of episodes as well. Uh, the Duffer brothers are both. But it's all, you know, you have to be a writer to be a showrunner because again, the name of the game is to keeping a, a tone and consistency and coherent. So you have a writer's room and all your writers get together. And the things that you have to do is you have to do an outline for the season, right? Where you're taking, sometimes even beyond where things are going. And you also have to have a series Bible, which talks about different elements of a character. You know, it's so you can, and this is done often for comic books as well. You know, anything where multiple people are working on a project and have to reference something. They'll even do it for artists, by the way, in comic books. Uh, you know, there's like, um, in, in animation, you've seen an animation. They're sheets. Con I think they're called contact sheets. I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but you look at them. And they're guidelines for other artists to come in if they're going to work on it, so they can know what the how the character is drawn specifically. You know, because it's a character. It has traits. You know, etc. Uh, so you have the series, you have the show bible, and you have the outline, and then the the, the um, assignments are handed out to you know who should handle each episode, and it's usually done um, politically sometimes, but also on you know each writer's strength. Oh, this episode focuses on a female character, so who writes good uh, women, right? And this one has a lot of action. Who writes good action, etc. And that's how they divide it up. And then they also divide it up amongst the directors, uh, and that and that is divided up the exact same way. But writers again are the most important because you have to maintain that cohesiveness. And, and the showrunners uh, oversee all of that. Story cohesiveness, visual cohesiveness, making sure the character arcs are uh, evident throughout the season, etc. Now, occasionally a famous director will come out of television. James Burroughs and Larry Charles are two very famous comedy directors. And these days, because there's such a demand for directors for blockbusters in Hollywood, a lot of directors on dramas like Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, etc. will make the jump. But TV writing, TV writers are so busy, and it's such a lucrative business if you can be a showrunner. So if you're not a showrunner, your goal is to become a showrunner, right? To create your own show. Because the Duffer brothers are like, well, I could go make a movie, and I think they very much could, but I'm making so much money off of Stranger Things, and it's so taking up my time, I really can't do anything else. I mean, look what the David, uh, DB, uh, David, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss decided to do next. They decided another television show because it's just so, it's, 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 a, it's a steady job too. If it can go on, you don't have to worry about where's your next gig coming from, whereas a movie is a one-off. Sometimes you can get uh, a franchise, but often it's rare for directors to stay through the whole thing. Uh, so anyway, that's the answer to your question. It's a scheduling. Uh, it's just, you know, it's tackling so much material uh, over a short period of time that you just simply, uh, you, you know, you, you need to divide it up. And showrunners are the ones that make sure that it's, it's um, as flawless as you saw. All right, so anyway, that's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories, Thorne's viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.